We have um, uh, music and concert coming up to really serenade Reverend Jackson. But before then, uh, there are lots of questions. I've been getting a lot of emails this afternoon from students who actually are interested um, in hearing from you, Reverend, about where we are as a nation. Um, one of the questions says, uh, is the Trump election the white uprising of 2016? How can we change the systemic mechanisms that benefit white people in America? Can it be done? We've been here before. You know, in 1861, the choice was slavery or freedom, union or uh, secession. We chose union and freedom. We passed that test. 1964, the choice was Goldwater arguing the case for statehood segregation and Johnson for a new inclusive America. We won that test. We didn't win the test last Tuesday, but it is not over. I say it's not over because with a two million popular people vote, the people spoke louder than those who opined. We must not give up hope. Every now and then it's cloudy, but it does not mean that the sun is not shining beyond the clouds. Don't surrender your spirit. Don't turn on your neighbors. It is wrong to ban Muslims. It is It is wrong to glorify tearing down walls in Germany and building walls between us and Mexico. It is wrong. It is wrong for men to try to control women's bodies and deny women the right of self-determination. It is wrong. It is wrong to tell somebody's LGBTQ to violate their person. It is wrong. It better be fight the right fight and lose temporarily than fight the wrong fight and win. Let's keep fighting the right fight. So, I'm, I'm curious to know uh, what your reaction was on the night of the election uh, because uh, this was not only a national event but a global event. The world was watching what was going to happen in the United States. Uh, what was your reaction? I was disappointed, <laughs> but champions play with pain. You fall down, you get up again, because the ground is no place for champions. You have to play even with the pain and seek to understand what you're looking at. The fact that there is legitimate economic anxiety and pain at the base, we've globalized capital, but not human rights. No international law, not women's rights, not children's rights. If we are playing a basketball game in China, we can live with the outcome. If we're playing a, uh, a trade game with China, we can't live with the outcome. On the athletic side, why can we accept the outcome? The playing field is even, and the rules are public, and the goals are clear. The referee is fair and the score is transparent. That's not true on the trade side. So fair trade is the answer, not isolation. We must learn fair trade is the answer. We cannot go into isolation. We are one third of our own hemisphere. Two thirds of our neighbors speak Spanish. English is a minority language in this hemisphere. We need bridges, not walls. We are a great nation because we reach out. When we live above international law and human rights and self-determination and economic justice, we declare, un we declare preemptive wars and pay no price for it. We must live with and in the world, not above it. Arrogance precedes the fall. The United States is the leading superpower. Um, looking at what happened Tuesday night, uh, you get to travel around the world a lot. I'm curious how you think other nations uh, because the U.S. Uh, for a long time has ascribed itself this sort of a moral authority to call out nations that supposedly are violating human rights or may not be, you know, uh, 
really on the up and up. Uh, even the State Department keeps a list of nations that it claims have human rights violations. Nelson Mandela under Bush was listed as a terrorist, you know, until it was removed. I'm curious now, uh, how do you think other nations like Egypt and others would now view the United States looking at, you know, uh, the, the, the political system here today? Most of our moral authority is our own self-described label. I heard uh, someone say the, the other day that we have been a great democracy for 240 years. That counts since 1776. African, African landed here in, in, in 1619. We were here 157 years before. 1776, didn't we matter as work without wages? We went from no rights to three-fifths of a human being, from that to Jim Crow, from that to segregation. We, are, we, we have before us the challenge of becoming a moral authority. And now we find ourselves growing increasingly arrogant. Uh, there's, there's strength and humility, uh, not in arrogance, in love, not in hate. Uh, if your neighbor's house is on fire, you say, I'm looking at the ball game, I hear a siren, my neighbor's house is on fire. Well, I know he was in house on kitchen fire because he drinks and smokes and, and sifts pot and all kinds of drugs. And he went to sleep with a cigarette burning and so his house is on fire. He has a problem. He does have a problem. But the wind blows and you live next door. <laughs> so, none of us are safe until all of us are safe. We are each other's keeper. In a world where, well, if, we could, if, if we got on a plane in New York, one going to Senegal, one going to uh, L.A., we get there about the same time. Science has dwarfed distance and, and, and technology has distance, has distance has shortened time. There are no more foreigners in this world. Everybody sees what everybody else is doing in real time. And so learning to live together is a moral challenge. I hope that we're up to that task. And I, I want this university to remain a moral sanctuary for caring for people. Care for all your classmates. Care for all of your classmates and all your faculty members. We all matter at U of M. Set the pace for the nation. We're number one, not just when you play our way, but... <laughs> So, I mean, you, you, <laughs> be number one when you play Ohio State. <laughs> so, you know, I was looking at the, the images across the nation, the protests uh, in New York, in Chicago, across the land. Uh, normally those images come to us from uh, the television screens around the world when nations do not accept the legitimacy of their governments. They take to the streets to protest to basically um, register legitimate discontent about the president, about the leaders themselves. But for the first time, perhaps in recent memory, recent history, we're seeing in the United States massive protests, thousands of people across the nation registering legitimate discontent. What do you make of that? And what does that say about the U.S.? I, where I remember we are some today? Mexican children the other day crying for fear that their parents would be deported. There were some young Muslim girls who were upset because the hijab had been snatched from their heads. And if that happens to any one of your classmates, embrace them. You must be your own private sanctuary for your classmate, your friend, your neighbor. We cannot stand either by To be silent is to betray our conscience. We must not be silent in the face of these violations of human rights. The black Amer rights. America. That's why I said regularly there's a there's a tug of war for the soul of America. Shall it be aristocracy for the few and, and then make a lot of money and pay no taxes? Or shall it be a democracy for the many? Shall it be one person, one vote? Or shall we assume that one corporation is one person, which is so absurd and vulgar? Who are we? We have an identity crisis. We must be that land that we talk about. Give me your tired. You're poor, you're hungry, your whole mass of yearn to breathe. What makes us great is embrace those who yearn for freedom, who yearn for dignity. 
at universities like this, there'll be students on this campus who fear being put out of class and deport, deporting after the next semester. We must put, take a strong stand against having our classmates deported. We must be each other's sanctuary. Um, I know you, uh, you just spoke with um, uh, Senator Bernie Sanders. I'm curious uh, as to your take. What do you think was, uh, what was it that was underestimated about this election that has proven those perhaps who were thinking optimistically, you know, supporting their other candidate Hillary Clinton wrong? What was, what was it that was underestimated about this election? In, in what sense, Bickley? Democrats were anxious that basically they were excited that Hillary Clinton was going to win. So obviously they underestimated something about the election that uh, pivoted to Trump. There are two issues. One, she did win. <laughs> the popular vote. In a democratic society, the popular vote matters. And a suppressed vote matters, and as a consequence, between the popular vote lead and the suppressed vote, that dynamic equals victory. And we would not do well to assume that popular vote does not matter. Anybody that do that will accept uh, in your cities emergency managers rather than elected officials. E elected officials, you get elected one day, and they're going to give you an emergency manager the next day. That does, that's the kind of electoral college. We demand the right that the elected officials represent us and let one person, one vote stand. And I would certainly hope that we would not give up on that. I think so long, while there are those who want to make the Second Amendment a priority, I say the First Amendment is first because the First Amendment is a priority. Use your right to, to demonstrate, but do so nonviolently, with discipline, goals, targets, time. Demonstrations matter when they're clear and focused and nonviolent. President Barack Obama, the nation's first African-American president, has less than two months in office. In your remarks, you said he should offer a preemptive, as you call it, a pardon for Hillary Clinton. Are there other items or list of things that you would like Obama do before he exits the White House? I think, first of all, in some perspective, when he came in office, we lost 800,000 jobs that month. You have a net gain of jobs every month since. That matters. The banks were in a global meltdown. They've been revived. Not connected to reinvestment and lending, but revived. Uh, the automotive industry had gone down. Even Americans were laughing at low quality cars out, coming out of uh, Michigan. And that was number one again. 20 million Americans have health insurance that did not have it before. Somebody said, well, the problem with affordable health care is it balloons at the end. If a new car comes off the lot and the brakes are not working, the steering wheel is not working, don't destroy it. You, you recall it and fix it. Don't go backwards from affordable health care. People who don't have jobs and make, need affordable health care more than ever. And so, There are two things you could do. One is, uh, if you were, just look at Detroit for a moment, as we think creatively for a moment. If that's a commitment that we have 100,000 vacant homes and abandoned lots in Detroit, and about the same in Chicago, to remove lead paint jobs, to do landscaping and cut the weeds and the bushes down, and use SBA loans to put entrepreneurs in business jobs, to demolish those homes and businesses that cannot be restored, jobs. Where there are boards put up window panes and put in painting and glazing and roofing, that may be more jobs than people if jobs are a priority. Let put America back to work be a priority. That's what Dr. King's last mission. And so we need a White House conference on violence, causes and cures, all you do is dust off the current commission report, violence, causes, and cures. We're the most heavily armed nation on earth. Um, we lost about 6,000 soldiers in Iraq in 10 years and 30,000 a year at home. We are the most violent nation on earth. We can't deny it, and we certainly should not brag about it. And when the idea of allowing 
military assault weapons to be sold on, on commonplace. They have no defense against these weapons. Uh, I don't know what the executive order can do, but these, are, these weapons can shoot down planes. Uh, they shoot up churches and theaters. We must ban military assault weapons. You said. And I repeat, I, I, I don't misunderstood about this hitler business. Lincoln could have taken a position, given the, the Civil War, where uh, Calhoun and Lee and those guys sought to overthrow our government. They would have been convicted and hung, tried, executed. Lincoln said, for the good of our nation, let's heal the wounds of war and go forward. And he forgave them and, and pardoned them. And there was some consternation because there are those who wanted him to punish them. 800,000 Americans were killed more than any other war since that time. But Lincoln chose healing and not hurting. You said, wait, 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 same as came with, with Nixon. There were those who just wanted, wanted to, just a little of Nixon given what Watergate meant. And it would have been a uh, kind of uh, gratification for some. We finally got him. President Ford said, no, we don't need him for truth. truth. We need him to move on, let go on with the nation's business. Uh, and by the way, Nixon was not tried, was not convicted, uh, and didn't apply for a pardon. Ford made an executive order in the national interest of America. Hillary Clinton has not been tried or convicted, been facing all those hearings, but there are those who want to drag her for the next three years into making her the center of them of defining who we are. It's not fair, it's not necessary. If you unleash a special prosecutor, they have godlike powers, more than even attorney generals cannot stop them. Presidents cannot stop them. They will not stop until they find some reason to put her in jail. What a travesty that would be. How divisive, how unnecessary. I say not only pardon her, but there are several thousand, several thousand other Americans who have paid their federal dues for the crime they committed and pardon them too. A kind of emancipation proclamation. Let's start over again. Uh, Reverend. Now, I'm not, I'm not talking about letting those in jail out. That's not what I'm discussing. They're, they're paying that to those who have served their time and are out. Right. They still have the, the burden of the label of, of ex-felon. Many of them can't vote and they can't function. And we reduce, their, their, that, we reduce the damage and reduce their person, reduce their productivity. What's the purpose if the judge gives you five years, why should the society give you 25 more? So, um, There's another issue that I want to bring up because you talked about putting America back to work, uh, the Flint water crisis. Uh, what happens to Flint now? Flint needs water bottles, not water pipes, not water bottles. The people of Flint stand out. There, there are nine other places in Michigan with water as poisonous, as it were, in Flint. It just say, it says that I, I, I'm inclined to believe that there have been uh, a lot of publicity around Flint. Uh, if there were commitment to, in, in the, if that's the infrastructure project, you put steel workers back to work and pipe for those construction people back to work, save lives in the environment. In the environment, we have no idea the impact of water with heavy lead on, on the lives of children the rest of their lives. Flint is a national disgrace and should be a national priority. This governor has a $600 million rainy day fund. Not a dime has gone to Flint. It, Flint is raining in Flint, raining down poison. The federal government calls Flint a, uh, an emergency, not as a disaster. So the federal government offers $5 million rather than $95 million. Flint is a disaster zone and needs recovery now. Flint deserves recovery. Now. Uh, towards the end of the Bush, um, we, we saw the auto industry crisis towards the end of the Bush administration. Obama, President Obama came in and rescued the industry. Now we're seeing the Flint water crisis. What do you expect or should we expect uh, what should be done as it relates to the administration of Donald Trump? 
Well, he has said that a priority for him, and it may be coming around this year, is to invest in infrastructure. It certainly is a way between put America back to work. We have several trillion dollars in offshore taxes that have not been paid. He understands how that works. <laughs> and uh, there should be a system arranged, a difference made, to bring that money back to America, target for reinvestment. These inner cities need more than a uh, bank, Dr. Cecil. They need development banks. When we say Marshall Plan, we're not talking about the amount of money in Marshall Plan. It may have been 13 billion. What made the Marshall Plan significant was in a zone that was 50 years long term low interest loans in these inner cities that have been devastated by bank exploitation uh, and government lack of investment uh, and by various forms of of, of escape. We need not only to, to redevelop them, but a banking system for those zones for reconstruction. We know how to reconstruct nations, and we should apply it at home. You, you talk about Detroit and reconstruction a lot, and I, I spoke to the mayor's administration this week for a column tomorrow about how the city of Detroit responds to the Trump administration. Um, how do you think, or what should urban cities do Chicago, Detroit, Washington, you name it, across the nation. Uh, how should they relate to the new administration in Washington? We need economic reconstruction, but we, but we cannot trade off how we treat our neighbor. I want a job, but the price you pay for it cannot be to violate people's human rights. We can do both. You, you can rebuild schools without having children in school crying, fearing deportation. You can rebuild cities without having, uh, without banning Muslims. You can rebuild cities without, without xenophobic language and behavior. So that the, the issue is not shall we reconstruct uh, the cities, shall we reconstruct relationships. Two thousand, we share 2,000 miles of border with Mexico, 2,000 miles. We do more trade with Mexico on a given day than we do with China and Japan. Do you want to make your next door neighbor an enemy? It's irrational. Mexico is the, is the gateway to South Central Latin America. That's why I said, as we think globally, not just locally, and see the world through a door not to a kill, we are 6% of the world's population. And Putin, in his, Mr. Trump's group, represents 6%. Most that one eighth of the human race is African, one fourth Nigerian, two thirds of our neighbors are Latin Americans. Most people in the world today are yellow, brown, black, non Christian, poor, female, young, and don't speak English. In that world, we must lead the world in coexistence and not threaten co annihilation. In that world, we must live together. I want to run some names by you. Uh, these are these are being talked about as potential picks, cabinet secretaries. For the new administration. Don't do that to me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Rudy Giuliani, the former mayor of New York, is being uh, mentioned as a potential, uh, the number one diplomat for the United Nations, for the United States. Um, Alabama Senator Jeff Sessions is also, his name is in the, in the ring as a potential attorney general. What is your take so far about these names that have been put out here? Make America great again. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they, re they represent their party. It seems to me that, that some people got to make some decisions like, I really voted for him, but I'm willing to excuse all of this stuff to get to him because I might get a job. You should not risk filing your neighbor even for a job. We, we need jobs. We also need decency and dignity and a sense of humanity as well. And I, I'm concerned that as we look at these, some of these names are being surfaced, that um, they may do our nation harm. But that, the, 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 if, we, if we concede this election and don't fight for the suppressed vote, uh, and, and December 19th, which is the day the electors elect, we'll have to live with that for a season. It will not be a pretty picture because the world is not standing by waiting for us to violate them. We, we, isolation is not the way of the world. 
globalization is the will of the world, but it must be balanced globalization. It's interesting that our, our telecom and our um, trans media has a balanced system, but our economics do not. And so we must balance our, our global economics. Also, most people don't realize we are not a part of the, of the, of the world uh, court. So we, we, only, only poor nations, when they violate, are poor before the world court. But we should, we, should, we should not live above the world court. We should all commit ourselves to justice. When your school plays Ohio State in a few days from now, on the real side, you want to win the game. You really geek to win the game. And if it's 10 yards for every first down, and six point fall touchdowns, you can accept the outcome. If one school has to run 12 yards for first down, one has to run eight yards, you can't accept the outcome. It is just out of justice. Peace comes out of justice, a sense of fairness. Uh, and you cannot favor the team that's wearing the gray and red or the team that's wearing blue and gold. There must be a sense of fairness. We seem to have given up on justice as a reasonable standard. Justice is reasonable. Uh, it, it is often said, Reverend, that you know, a, a true functioning democracy has to have a vibrant press. Uh, we've seen uh, a pattern now since Donald Trump's election, uh, picking up a fight with the media this morning. He was on Twitter with the New York Times. Any concerns about uh, the role of the media here in moving forward, especially after this election, lessons learned? Well, one lesson learned is that the media cannot the media did a lot to promote Trump uh, and was not as, did not critique as well as it should have critiqued. But we need a free and vibrant media. And we cannot, and uh, social media opinions are not the same as well trained journalists who think you the research. Mm. I mean, the social media opinions cannot compare with the well thought out story. We must not give up on that narrative. I have two more questions. Um, we've seen before this election uh, the new wave. We talked about this, uh, University of Missouri, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and so forth. Uh, but going back to the civil rights movement, it's well documented that you know, the movement for social change actually started on student campuses. Uh, for some, this movement represents perhaps a new era, a new civil rights movement, or perhaps reigniting the past. What role do you see students playing on university campuses across this nation at this point in time? Being a source of conscience, use their freedom to mature into a sense of social justice. Uh, I remember 19 years old going to jail with seven classmates trying to use the public library. I came into my sense of maturity within the country, losing my fear of jails and death by going to a jail. And then other jailings fighting to open the doors. The good news is what keeps my hope alive is that we have these dark moments, but we're winning. When I look at the Carolina Panthers for the Atlanta Falcons, they couldn't have been behind the cotton curtain. It would have been illegal. You couldn't have had the Olympics behind the cotton curtain in Atlanta, Georgia. You couldn't have had CNN in Georgia. You couldn't have had South Carolina as the number one producer of tires behind the cotton curtain. You couldn't have had the great Clemson, Alabama game behind the cotton curtain. We, we are more civil. But it's just like swimming from Britain to France. It's not the distance that the tackles from. It's the undercurrent. And there is in life... Uh, undercurrents. There are crosswinds. There's the unanticipated. And sometimes these winds knock you down. You cannot look for the first blade of grass to lie on. You've got to get back up and keep fighting. I repeat again, deep water does not drown you. You drown when you stop kicking. Paul said there was a shipwreck one time and people were inclined to panic. He said, well, some uh, made it on boards and some on broken pieces. A few days ago, John Graves, I was walking down the street and I saw, well, I really didn't see it because I slipped and fell, uh, broken sidewalks. And a root had grown under one of the trees and lifted the sidewalk and it was kind of lifted. 
And I, I looked back to where I had fallen, and in that crack, there was some grass coming out. Just a little daylight, a little sunshine, a little water. Life sometimes comes through the cracks. Sometimes it does not come in whole pieces. You must find life where it is and let life express itself. Even semen cannot suppress it ultimately. We the people, in, in, the, end, in the end, right will prevail. Uh, suffering breeds character, and character breeds faith, and then faith will prevail. It is about on that belief that we go forward and don't surrender. Uh, that's a nice segue, Reverend, to my final question. Next week is Thanksgiving. Um, there are lots of families who will be having Thanksgiving, but in fear, in a state of fear, unsure what will happen the next day, the next week, in January. What do you say to those families uh, that, you know, might have a different Thanksgiving this year because of the climate in the nation today? Well, if I were a Turk, I would not organize a Thanksgiving dinner. That's the first thing. <laughs> and, and you got that point? The <laughs> Turk should not organize Thanksgiving dinners. You got the point, Bengali? Yes, I do. I get <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we cannot settle for people having a meal, a day, a year. People need to have the capacity to have a balanced meal every day. That's the first issue. The second issue, some of the great heroes and heroes of our time are people who, in World War II who found threatened Jews and gave them sanctuary. Their lives were defined by providing for frightened people sanctuary. A little love will do. If there is some student, some classmate of yours who you know is anxious and maybe cry at night because the fear of deportation, maybe you ought to take them home for Thanksgiving with you and be kind. And not only should your school be a sanctuary and not and, and fight for policies that protect I mean, you have students in this university right now who have come against great odds and they're doing well in class, but they fear being deported. We can mobilize and fight for policies that stop that from happening. I think if we mobilize, the worst may not happen. It is it's silence that's betrayal. Uh, when we didn't have the right to vote, we got the right to vote because we marched with discipline. And all I'm saying to you is that fight for the protected right to vote. What makes America right, great is the right to fight for the right. Fight for affordable health care. Fight for student loan debt reduction. Uh, fight to, to, to forgive student loans. Fight for that which is meaningful to you. Fight for Supreme Court justice. The moral is supreme, not the supreme in their power. And keep fighting. And there are checks and balances. Uh, you know, Trump would not be to move on America like he moved on, on a hotel. There, there are checks and balances uh, because I interest. One reason why he is not going to move the way on affordable care he thought he was because many of his constituents need affordable care. There are people who were so confused until they wanted affordable care, but they didn't want Obamacare. <laughs> they wanted omelet, but didn't want eggs. But now they will find out. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Reverend.